But then, in classic Jesus fashion, he won't just be quiet. He won't just stop talking. He has to throw in that one more zinger, that one more thing that even though we're only limping across the line, is going to make it even harder. And he says in 24, For I tell you, none of those who were invited will actually get to taste of it. Which gives us the biggest curveball of all. So how do we get into the kingdom? I mean, it's not invitation only, because he just said it's not invitation only. It's not only not invitation only, the invited people don't even get to go. So what do we do with this? I mean, are we to assume that in the end, and so here's part of what we've done with it. We've made it a Jew-Gentile thing. We did that so we could kind of figure out where to land on this. What we did with this story is went, well, Israel had been invited to the party in covenant with God, and they rejected it. So God went out and got all the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind, and then he went and got all of us. See, we, we, you notice how we love it if we get to be the, uh, the third ring. If we get to be the third ring, then this is a good story. Because that means, oh, apostate Israel missed out on the party. God's not going to invite them in in the end anyway. The only way you're going to get in is to be like us. Because notice whenever we need it, it feels good to be that third ring. When we need it, it feels good to be the people in desperate need of grace. And so when we need that desperate need of grace, we pull in, we receive that, des- we receive that grace. So... I think you probably know that's not where I'm going to land on this, is to say that God's saying to national Israel, you're the one. No, that's not where I'm going to land at all. And, and here's why, because I think all that that does at the end of the day is develop, in some ways, the grossest form, as if there's a good form, but maybe the grossest form of anti-Semitism. And, that, and what I mean by the grossest form is the kind that exists under the guise of Christianity. That's the grossest form of anything, by the way, is when you attach Christ to something that excludes people. It's the grossest form of excluding. It's to put Jesus on the front of it and go, that's what Christians, that's what we stand for. And you go, Ugh, I don't, man, we really ought to reconsider that which slammed the door with Jesus on the front of it. So you go to work through that, okay? So let's don't land there. Because we can do better. And I'll tell you why we can do better. Because Jesus isn't finished. You probably assume that as much. Because your chapter keeps going and Jesus keeps talking. And so there are other things that Jesus keeps saying. And when we land at the end, we find that Jesus gives us an explanation that works because it scares us. (laughs) <laughs> Let me say that again, or maybe say it better. I know that sometimes we think, well, if Jesus says it, it's never going to bother us. Oh, contrary. If Jesus says it, it will often bother us because it's the truth that is sharper than a two-edged sword that's coming out of his mouth, and that divides parts of our life. And so before we land there, I just want to make sure that we are in the same boat because we're all on the same water, we might as well, and we're in the same room, we might as well be in the same boat, all right? And being in that same boat, we're sitting at that dinner. We've just had a wonderful evening of conversation with Jesus. He's a rather delightful fellow. His disciples are nice guys. He tells funny stories. He's healed a few people. It's been spectacular. And then at the end of the party, he drops this little bomb on us that maybe our party wasn't as good as it could have been because we didn't bring enough of the trashiest kinds of people into it. Yeah, I'm not real happy with this. Elbowed my neighbor, said he could have left that out. The night was going well until he said that. I could have done without that. But you know, hey, in the end, we all actually get to get in the kingdom. Everybody that gets to go is blessed regardless of who they are. You know, that's, that's kind of my response to Jesus. We're, that's us. In the end, we all get to go. In the end, whoever gets there, that's the ones that are blessed. And then, lo and behold, Jesus just won't leave it alone. And here comes this bizarre story about a master who invites us to the party. But we got too much stuff going on. And then he invites the poor. And that's not enough. So he invites the dregs, the true outsiders. I think by the time he gets to this part in the story, the room's dead quiet. I don't think there's anybody talking. I don't think there's anybody elbowing. I don't think there's anybody laughing. I think there's a little bit of disturbance. It's unease in the room especially when he drops that chestnut in that no one invited gets to come. And now they start to look at each other and go, then how do we get in? No one invited gets to come. So let's start at the end. Who got invited? 
Those who got invited were living their lives, buying their homes, buying their properties, buying their oxen, going on their honeymoons. Is it a diatribe against wealth? Is it a diatribe against success? No, but no. Everyone who was invited was living their lives. They had other things to do. They had stuff that made life worth living. They held on to it. They did well with it. Everybody invited was a success. Who gets invited next? The ones that never have anything because they can't do anything to get it. They're the bottom end of the meritocracy pyramid. They're getting crushed and stepped on all the time. Jesus says, let's start there. Bring in people that'll never get in by themselves. Now there's openings at the table. Oh, we still have room? Okay, let's go get people who didn't even know I was throwing a party. They don't even know what the other side lives like. Bring them in here and show out. Go get everybody and anybody that you can find and bring them in. Oh, and by the way, tell the world that the only way to get into this party is to get in without the original invitation card. And here's why the original invitation card doesn't work. Jesus, from this point on, gives the cost of discipleship. That famous, unless a man hate his mother and his father and his brother and his sister and follow me, he doesn't have my life in him. That's a hard pill to swallow. Why does he throw that in here at the end of this dinner party story? Because he's heading to this verse in Luke 14, 33. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. It's not exciting. It's not motivating. It's a little scary. It's a little worrisome. It's a little infuriating. It's a lot confusing. What does Jesus mean? None of you can become my disciples unless you give up all your possessions. Remember again, I know I'm, I know I'm slow walking you here, but I want to land in the same spot at the same time. That's why we're doing it. So I keep bringing that story back so that we can propel it just a baby step forward every time so that we're all landing in that same space. How did this whole thing start? A guy in the party lands on, oh, well, in the end, everybody that's in the kingdom is blessed. And Jesus goes, are you sure? Not so fast. You're making it sound like you're getting in. Which pin drop happens in the room and Jesus tells this crazy story and lands on unless you give up all your possessions you can't be my disciples and this is what this says to me everything that you have is the exact price that you have to pay to get into the kingdom everything you have has to go to the cross. Or if you're poor, you take your poor and you take it to the cross. If you're rich, you take your rich and you take it to the cross. When Jesus says, unless you give up your possessions, keep it in context. Unless you give everything you have to him, how can you receive everything he gives to you. Grace is not simply that God gives you a bunch of stuff in the middle of your stuff. Grace is that you brought everything you are to him and you put it on his cross. Everything you are. And when he nailed it to his cross, he rolled the stone away in your heart and stood up inside of you and said, now everything I am you get to be. Mm -hmm. 